Okay, thank you very much, Lucas. I'm sure it goes without saying, but um, it would help you to have your um, Bible open, uh, the book of Philippians chapter two. This evening, we're gonna follow the text more closely than we did last week. At the beginning of the session last week, I gave us a lot of context to the epistle itself. And that took a lot of time and meant that we couldn't go through all of the text, read it through. But tonight, I hope that we will read the chapter in its entirety. But just for a brief recap over what we covered last week, um, the book itself was written around AD 60. Paul is in prison at the time of writing. We think probably that he was in Rome, but there are other opinions on his location uh, at the time of writing. It's about 10 years after Paul planted the church. The way in which God guided Paul to be in Philippians was, was very supernatural. It was clear that God wanted him there at a specific time and, and God did miraculous things while he was in uh, Philippi as a place as he did in most of the places where Paul was, of course. But the significant thing to note from the context of how the church started is that Paul was delivered from prison initially when he was in Philippi and now he has not been delivered from prison, not at this point anyway. And so Paul wanted to help the church to understand how God works, how God moves, what, what it means to serve a sovereign God who, who is loving, consistently loving, whether we're in prison or out of prison, the, the fact that sometimes God gives us a, 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 um, a, a mighty deliverance from a circumstance and other times he allows us to go through a difficult season and through the challenge of a difficult circumstance. God is consistent, he's always in control, he's always loving and he always has a plan. And so Paul, through his own example, through his experience, he was illustrating through his life and his teaching to the church in Philippi, how you should live consistently, joyfully, positively, whatever you're going through, whether you be in isolation in prison or whether you be out on the streets preaching and teaching freely without hindrance, you should always just be loving God, keeping Jesus at the center of your life and making sure that you make every moment count and trusting God that he will work out his plan for your good and for his glory. So in chapter two, there is a slight change of direction. Now, Paul has, as I said, he's, he's, he's made mention of the fact that he's in prison. And he's also referenced just at the end of chapter one, that the church in Philippi, the Christians in Philippi, they are currently going through a persecution because of their faith. So they're kind of being attacked from without. There are things coming from outside of the church and are coming against them. And now Paul knew that when attacks came from outside of the church to attack the church, sometimes people would scatter. Sometimes people would, would, would maybe walk away from their faith. But what would happen is that God would use that to kind of prune and refine and bring some strength and solidarity and some commitment to the community which actually would have the effect of building them together cementing their relationships kind of making them more resolute in their walk with God the bigger problem for the church was actually the attacks from inside of the church the things which could potentially compromise holiness spiritual integrity or that they could bring division so when attacks would come from the outside maybe it was the romans causing trouble maybe it was some uh, representatives of a cult or a, um, a temple that got got offended by paul preaching that jesus was the only way when those things came against the church it, it would shake them of course but actually the 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 net result would be a positive one for the church it would make them ultimately stronger what was difficult for the church to endure was when things started to go wrong from the inside. Jesus mentions this in his teaching uh, when people said and accused him of actually working on behalf of Beelzebub or, or, or Satan. He said, that, how can I be working for Satan while I'm driving out demons? Because the house divided, it can't stand. It, it kind of defies logic. Why would I be casting out demons and that actually be a work of the enemy i'm actually working against myself 
So Jesus understood and he had taught that houses that were, were actually working against one another from the inside would ultimately be the beginning of its end. And Paul wanted the church in Philippi, as he did with all of his congregations, he wanted, to, wanted them to understand that they need to, to, to be very alert to the fact that, that subtle things could get in in their thinking, maybe some bickering, some arguments, some ideas that would begin a slow rot uh, in, in people's minds and hearts, which would bring animosity or the people would start to get offended by one another and want to keep their distance. And what that would do is it would begin to bring fraction and division to the inside of the church, to the point where if it wasn't dealt with, it would eventually kind of make the church kind of break apart and Paul needed the Philippian church to understand how to address uh, that. Now to quote a guy called N.T. Wright who's a fairly well-known Bible scholar, he when, when, when he reflects on the the Philippian epistle he said if a church wants to go for truth often peace comes at that expense if you go for really being uh, um, focused on we want to be true and right about everything that can bring uh, a division because you start nitpicking over stuff and you start uh, going after things at the cost of the the kind of the peace of a community and he said if you go for uh, for peace often that will come at the expense of truth because you start to say well let's not get too fixed on what we believe about stuff let's kind of keep ourselves together and try and just ignore our differences in in terms of theology or thinking about certain things it's more important that we just are happy together as a group rather than being clear about what we believe just in case that offends somebody so he recognized that for paul if he pushed people towards being tenacious about something that they they felt was was particularly um a, a kind of a theological hill to die on then that could bring a wobble on the side of peace in the community but if they went for peace then truth would start to wobble so what was the way to kind of bring those things together because Paul cared about truth. Don't hear what I didn't say. Truth is incredibly important. And also peace is incredibly important. But how do we divide between those issues which are unnecessary to get kind of worked up about? We just need to just leave those things to the Lord. And what are those areas where we, we, we just need to go for, for building peace and building community? And where are those times when we need to just say, well, no, actually, this is the hill to die on for me. I can't compromise on this. I'm not prepared to have the appearance of peace and togetherness while truth uh, uh, gets compromised on a certain issue. Now, what N.T. Wright points towards here is that Paul's answer to this is to go for Jesus. If you pursue Christ, if you pursue knowing him personally and living like him in his humility, what you will get is a good balance of the both. Because if you're pursuing Jesus and you're so caught up with Jesus as a community of people, you're automatically focusing on the essential stuff. And also, if you're focusing on Jesus, you're pursuing him, wanting to know him, know everything about him, be in deep bond and fellowship and actually live like him you will end up serving one another with a level of sacrifice that will actually build peace and community so paul's way of reconciling peace and truth was to focus on the person and the work of christ and say to the church if you live like jesus and if you pursue knowing him actually you will hit all the main, uh, all the main uh, targets of stuff that you need to believe as essential truth. And you will also, as a byproduct, serve one another in such a way that you will build community and a unity amongst you as a fellowship. So by explaining Christ and by explaining what he did by coming down from heaven to earth and, 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 and what that actually meant in terms of how we could emulate that, Paul was offering the church the best way to be able to guard against division and disunity that could potentially come in and do more damage than any persecution from outside of the church. So 
I'm going to read now verses one to four, and then we're going to stop at the end of those verses. And then um, we, we will go on section by section. So I'm reading from the NIV. Um, as a, a Bible college, they used to say that meant the nearly infallible version, but I'm sure some of you might have a difference of opinion on that. But just uh, if there's a few old King Jamers uh, who are reading along, just, just do your best to, 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 um, to follow me. So verse one of chapter two says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, this is unity topic there. If you have any comfort from his love, um, if you uh, any common sharing of the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete, being like minded, having the same love and being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each to, of you to the interests of the others. So Paul has four things here he's using to kind of lead the Philippians down a path. He's building them up to something. He says that if you're encouraged to be united with Christ, if you're feeling comforted by the love of Christ, if you're appreciative that through Jesus Christ you get to share in the Holy Spirit, if you're transformed by Christ and you now have tenderness and compassion, the message translation puts it, if, if you have a heart now and you really care, if you receive all of these things from Jesus, then the implication here is then this is how you should live for one another. If he has encouraged you, you should encourage one another. If he has comforted you, you should comfort one another. If you get to share in the Holy Spirit, recognize then you get to use that Holy Spirit to build up one another. If you now have compassion and tenderness that Christ has worked in you by his Holy Spirit, then that tenderness and compassion must outwork itself towards others. You must be tender and compassionate towards one another. So that raises the question, if we are to live in a way that actually builds others up and we're there to serve one another and not look to our own interests, but to the interests of one another, what is the balance between taking care of ourselves while we serve and build other people up? Because in church, I have seen both extremes of teaching on this i've seen people uh, 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 teach to, to almost love one another to such a degree that they never pay any interest in their own personal needs they they kind of give all their money away they never keep a savings account they're always serving one another but never taking time to kind of build up their their own strength through rest and recuperation and they're giving and they're giving and they're giving they're almost living boundaryless lives and it all seems very noble and it all seems very uh, um, Christian and lovely, but after a while, you can see people start to burn out because they never seem to take care of themselves. But on the other hand, there are people who take so much care of themselves that it seems to be that they only give other people the kind of the, the, the little bit of margin that they have left after they spend most of their time taking care and looking after themselves. And on the notes, I've, I've kind of addressed this, this topic with a, with a couple of sentences, which I, I hope will, will summarize and kind of uh, and sum this up in a way that's helpful to you. First of all, I said, there's a difference between self-care and love of self. There's a difference between self-care and love of self. Now, if you're taking care of yourself, that means, you know, you're making sure that you're not spending more money money than you have coming in that you're making sure that you get enough sleep at night that you're eating a good diet you're looking after your your family you're giving yourself time to rest and recuperate and you're doing that without guilt i don't believe that the 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 the, the way that we need to love each other comes at such a cost to ourselves that we burn out before our time because we've been giving out so much that we've we felt guilty over about having a good night's sleep that we spent maybe 20 nights in a row you know praying through the night and interceding through the night and all that's happening is we've got a lot of prayer 
uh, um, that's built up, but we have very little energy left and we're kind of burnt out. I believe it's okay to take care of yourself, but there's a difference between self-care and the love of self. And it has to do with a, a point of emphasis because taking care of yourself is necessary in order for you to love and take care of others. If you don't take care of yourself and you're gonna have nothing in the tank to take care of others. The next section, uh, a sentence I put here, is that there's a difference between pursuing your goals and vain ambition. Paul says that we should do nothing out of vain ambition. And yet we're not gonna to turn to it now, but it's clear that Paul himself had goals. He talked about the goal for which Christ has called me heavenward. We can read in the book of Acts, he, he had goals or he had plans and visions of where he wanted to be in ministry, places he wanted to go, um, communities he wanted to reach. He wanted to go to places that hadn't been reached with the gospel and he wanted, wanted to blaze a trail there. So he had vision, he had goals, he had things that he wanted to com accomplish. But it wasn't vain ambition because the reason why he wanted to accomplish those things was not for him to be uh, regarded as the world's greatest apostle. It's because he wanted to make Jesus famous in every part of the world. So you can have goals without it being vain ambition because it all has to do with the attitude and the motivation of your heart towards the vision and the goals that you are setting. And the third and final one I would say on this point is there's a difference between knowing your value and living without properly honoring one another's value. I'm going to say that again. There's a difference between knowing your value and living without properly honoring one another's value. In modern society today, there is a lot of talk about knowing your worth, knowing your value, knowing that you are unique. And all of that stuff is, to a degree, pretty healthy because we need to understand that we are valuable. We're sons and daughters of the living God. We're created in the image of God. We have value because of who we have been made by God. So God has given us value. And as we know our value, we will live out our value. We, we are to turn the other cheek, but we're not to be a doormat. And if we understand that we have value, that we won't just put up with people having a bad attitude and trying to walk all over us because we have worth and we should we know we shouldn't be treated with disrespect not because of ourselves but because we are sons and daughters of God but knowing your own value should never mean that you put down on the value in other people in order for you to feel even more valuable in yourself so we can understand that we have unique value. We're created in God's image. He has sent his son to die for us. That's how much we are worth to God. He was prepared to send his son to die for us. But we shouldn't live in such a way that we ignore the value of others in order for us to do things and get places and, and, and try and find a way of building ourselves up in, in a way that we use kind of putting other people down to make us feel more better about ourselves. We get our value from being sons and daughters of God, not from comparing ourselves to other people. So we should value ourselves, but we should also make sure that we build up and show value and honor to those people around us. So I believe there is a balancing act. There is a tension sometimes to be held between those things, but we can take care of ourselves without being, um, uh, prideful and arrogant and we can pursue goals without it being ambition and we can know our value uh, without actually putting down the value of other people and we can we can hold those things in tension and actually live very productive lives but it still doesn't take away the fact that there will come times when to live for others will still come at a cost to us if we know our value, we're pursuing our goals and we're taking care of ourselves fine. And yet sometimes there are situations that come up where we have to be prepared to say, although I have value here right now and I don't maybe want to do this, it feels a bit demeaning to me or uh, um, there is a goal here I want to pursue, but if I pursue it, it will come at the cost of somebody else. Or if I take care of myself in this way, um, it will mean that, that, that potentially I'm going to start going down a road where 
I start getting a little bit big headed and a little bit kind of focused in and, and narcissistic and kind of introspective looking in on myself. It, it still comes at a cost from time to time if we're to do those things in a way that Jesus has modeled to us. So Paul now, he moves from saying to the Philippians that you should live for one another. God has loved you. You should love one another. God's comforted you. You should comfort one another. And he says, if you want to get the best definition of what this looks like, I'm going to present to you Jesus and something about what he did to come and serve you. Now, he draws out something which we don't maybe get the, the understanding of in the English language here, but it serves as a, as a poem. There is a meter and a rhythm to this in the original language that we don't get in the English translation. And generally it's accepted that the, the verses that we're about to get from Paul actually um, would probably have been around for quite a while as the kind of a hymn in order to teach theology to the church. So even before Nick McDavid and Sarah, you know, sing their songs and, and, and hymns that we get, get truth from, very early on in the church, Paul is reciting what we believe is a hymn which taught theology about the person of Christ. And it's an incredible, uh, a few verses packed with rich uh, and deep theological thinking about the person of Christ. So let's read now from verse 6 up until verse 11. So it says, uh, actually, sorry, verse 5, it says, actually, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, these verses here have been slightly controversial and slightly difficult to interpret for for quite some years and i'm not going to be able to give you the final uh, definition on all of the technicalities uh, of of what this means but i hope to give you some understanding of really what paul is driving at here with these verses now at the very beginning verse six it says who being in very nature god who being in very nature god so in the understanding of paul not just something that was written about jesus after theological reflection for several hundred years people in the early church believed that jesus was in his nature god although he came to earth and took on human flesh now, there are arguments out there that this verse here is not actually teaching that Jesus is divine. If you were to, to ask a Jehovah's Witness or ask a Unitarian what they felt these verses were meaning, they would not come to the conclusion that Jesus was divine based on this. But I'm going to give you my reasons why I believe this does teach that Jesus was God. Okay, if you look at verse, uh, sorry, the, where I put verse six on page chapter, page two in, in your notes. In the NIV, it says, Jesus being in nature God. And if you to have another translation, it says, though he was in the form of God. So the NIV puts the word nature, and some other translations put the word form. Now, the reason that the word form was used before the NIV translated it as such is because the original Greek word there, a word called morphe, it meant form, 
But the problem is there is no direct equivalent to that original Greek word in modern English. So translators are struggling to find a way of making sure that the English exactly represents that ancient Greek word. And so the word form can to some bring up ideas of an aesthetic, of an appearance, of a shape of something, rather than just being the substance of something. So some people have argued that the word morphe, the Greek word morphe, which is translated as form, in fact, I wouldn't recommend you read the New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, translation. They use the word form in this passage with the idea that it's saying that Jesus is in some kind of superficial shape or form or image of God, but that is a different thing to argue than saying that he has by nature the substance of God. I would disagree with that for, for a number of reasons. One is that the word itself can, it can in some contexts, not in biblical context, but if you to do some research in extra biblical literature, literature from the day, contemporary works to the Bible, but not the Bible themselves, there are occasional times when the Greek word morphe can be talking about an aesthetic, a form, a shape. But they are in the minority, by and large, when somebody is using that Greek word morphe, it has to do with not just the appearance, but the substance of something. To give you an illustration from uh, the Olympics, if you had an Olympic figure skater, and someone was to say that performance was amazing. He showed his true world class form. What you're saying is the skills, the abilities, the innateness that makes them a champion was now coming out. You weren't just seeing a championship performance, you were seeing the champion performing in a champion like way. And so the original word there is trying to explain that Jesus was in his form and substance on the inside, he was God. And so while some people can make a very slim case that this word doesn't necessarily always mean that, most of the time it does mean that. And you will see most commentaries from most theological scholars to say that's what that word means. The other thing there is at the beginning of the sentence, it says being in very nature God. And that's an important word to know as well. So the, the Greek word there is huparko. And if you were to read um, Luke chapter 11, you don't have to turn to this. You can get a, a, um, um, an example here of how that word is used. It says, if you then, verse 13 of Luke chapter 11, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And in some translations, even it says, rather than just though you were evil, though you being evil in some translations. The point there is that where that word is used throughout the Bible, the Hipparcho word is used throughout the Bible. It's speaking of not just acting like, but referring to the very deep substance of something that then comes out. So I can occasionally around my kids act like a fool and I might just do all kinds of kind of goofy things around them, but that is not a true reflection of my inner nature. By nature, I don't want to do kind of goofy things. I'd rather sit down with my kids and work through a, a Greek lexicon and talk about morphe and hupaku. So that would be my kind of thing to do. But for entertainment purposes, sometimes with my kids, I'll sit there and I'll, and I'll act the goat. And it's a bit of fun, but it's just, it's the, it's the appearance of something which is betraying actually really what I'm like on the inside. But my true being, as it were, is a far more conservative and constrained person by personality. So what the, the writer here is driving at, he's saying that word being, that, that, that true essence of, of what you are on the inside, then at some point has to 
come out. And Jesus is saying in Luke, though you being evil know how to give good gifts to your kids, though you are kind of of malintent on the inside, you can act in a certain way. Your true form is the one that's on the inside. That's where your being is most accurately represented. But that comes out sometimes in a different way. So to sum up there on this particular part, it's quite clear from the use of language yeah. and the way that this is, this, is, this is recorded that Paul, using this hymn, is teaching that Jesus was fully divine. That his nature, his being, and his form together were exactly the same as God the Father. He wasn't just in some way reflecting the Father like some sort of shiny mirror to reflect God's glory. He, he had glory and form and in his innermost being, which is why the NIV had taken the, the choice there to use the word nature, which is a word which maybe uh, in some ways might seem a stretch to those looking at the Greek, but does sum up the spirit of what is being communicated here but the application you can read in fact some more points on my on, on my notes there as to why else I, I think it's consistent to believe that Jesus was being described as uh, equal with God because he was God the application though for Paul's ends in this uh, chapter is that knowing that Jesus was God and yet taking on human flesh that shows a degree of humility and service that we should begin to try and emulate, but we will never be able to exactly copy. We will never be able to stoop as low as God stooped when he came into human flesh. The writer C.S. Lewis says that Jesus taking on flesh was more of a step down than an angel becoming a worm. And what he was saying was there is such a descent in, 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 sense, in the sense of God's divine being being prepared to take on human flesh if Jesus can do that, if he can descend from his glory in heaven, being in very nature God, being in the substance of God himself, and yet constrain himself, limit himself to work within the, con the confines of humanness, then you, church, have nothing to, to say is, is, is too much for you in terms of your own service to one another. If Jesus can do that for you, whatever you do to copy that, will be a pale reflection of that level of service and love. So what Paul is saying from this, although he's teaching theology, or maybe he would say reflecting theology of the church at that time about the being of Christ, he was using it in such a way to say to the church, this is your model and example of how you to serve one another. Some of the people in, church, in the church in Philippi would have had a bit of money. Lydia, we know, seems to be a successful businesswoman but Paul would have said to her as he would have said to the other people who had some kind of public reputation maybe a bit of money larger houses etc then you need to model Christ and be prepared to serve one another in sometimes menial ways or difficult ways or things which may make your pride uncomfortable but that's nothing that Jesus hasn't showed you he's prepared to do himself in in fact in a way a bigger way than you will ever be able to copy he's trying to get the church to see if jesus can do that for you being in very nature god living up in heaven with all of the glory and all of the power and all the prestige and the angels worshiping him and they come down and serve you wash people's feet love on you be prepared to kind of embrace you then there is nothing you should be you should be prepared to say no to in terms of your service Thank for you. one another Okay, I could say a few more things on that, but for purposes of our time, I will move on. Right, let me now read from verse 12 up until verse 18. It says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Great verse, but one we won't focus on, sadly. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life 
and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the, on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, the, the, the verse I want to highlight here and, and quickly kind of to zoom in on is verse 14, where it says, do everything without grumbling and complaining, to do everything without grumbling and complaining. The point I've made on the notes on page four is this. When your mindset changes, so will your mouth. If you begin to recognize what Christ has done for you, you will complain a lot less about what happens to you in your relationships and your circumstances around you. If you get it into your mind, deep into your mind, and there's a change of understanding, there's a kind of a revelation understanding of what Christ has done for you, the way you talk will be different your mouth will speak different kinds of things you will always have a reason to be thankful rather than complaining because you recognize that while there may be things that irritate you in the big picture of life what christ has done for you is a greater reason for you to celebrate and to talk positively than those little things that might irk you and normally otherwise trouble you so i believe what what Paul is saying to them here is that once you get an understanding and a comprehension of what Christ has done for you by laying aside the kind of the, the privileges of his majesty in heaven and coming to serve us here on earth, dying on a cross and living to make your, your life free from sin and modeling to you what love and commitment and service is like. If you understand, you truly believe and understand that thing, then you will start to speak differently because you can't know that and, 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 not change, and it not change you. It must have an outworking in the way that you even talk to one another. The, you see, the, the trouble was in the church there, that if they were gonna be divided, a lot of the division was gonna come out of what happens from their mouth, how they spoke to one another. The, the, maybe the coldness or the abrasiveness of, of, of a conversation. And so Paul, by recognizing the power of their tongue, the power of the way that they spoke and saying that you should be careful how you speak and you should actually just talk in a way that builds one another up. Because look at the way Jesus has loved you. That's the way you should speak and love one another. That's the kind of thing that will protect the unity of the church. I love this story that I heard some time ago about the, the problem with the, with, with the tongue or the mouth in church. And it's a story about the evangelist John Wesley. And there was, a, there was one time when John Wesley had gone to a town, I, in the story it wasn't referenced which town, but I imagine it was one of the towns in, in the UK, and he was preaching. And there was a, a Christian lady in the congregation listening to his sermon, who it says didn't really remember much of what John Wesley said about Jesus, because something irritated her, and that was the fact that he was wearing some sort of... Um, quite um, flamboyant cravat type neck scarf thing and it had some tassels off it and so she was annoyed that he was wearing this 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 neck scarf I, I expect she felt it was a bit too flamboyant or it looked a bit too posh or something for this guy who was who was preaching and she just got irritated by it so she went up to John Wesley after his sermon and she said brother Wesley will you suffer me just criticizing something for a moment and he said yes what what is it and she said i didn't really have chance to take in much of what you said because i was so irritated by seeing you wearing this particular neck scarf thing it's, it's it's got all these tassels and so forth coming off and it does it's unbecoming of a preacher i believe so apparently john wesley asked around for somebody with some scissors and so he got some scissors and he handed them to the lady and he said to her, now you're a woman of faith. You probably have an own, your own idea in your mind. Which, is, which, which part of this cravat neck scarf thing is particularly problematic for you? Will you take these scissors and cut it away? She said, I'll cut away everything on that scarf that I find offensive. He said, fine, you do that. So she takes the scissors and she hacks away at this, this neck scarf and takes away a lot of the tassels. Now he says to the woman, will you suffer a, a little bit of a, a, um, something while, while I uh, bring a challenge to you? And she, she says, well, I guess so. I've just 
been sharing something with you. He says, well, I can take these scissors now. And if you will stretch out your tongue, he says, I want to cut off something that offends me. And his point was that sometimes the way that we speak and the things that we speak about can be unnecessarily offensive. And sometimes we believe that we're just, we're trying to bring truth and we're trying to bring correction. And we feel that we're doing it in an honorable spirit, that we're just trying to help somebody out by uh, confronting them with something that they might not like, but we, we hope it you know, serves a, a higher purpose for their, for their living. But actually what we're doing is, while we feel that our motivation is noble, that when it's unnecessary and it's not kind, it's not building somebody up, it's not in keeping with the moment, then all we do is we tear down with our tongue rather than building up. And Paul wanted the church in Philippi to build one another up with the way they spoke and not tear one another down. My final point is this, from verse 19, I'll read through uh, probably, not up to the end of the chapter, just for time's sake, but just to the end of, um, let's say, we'll read up to when I feel ready to stop. Okay, verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother and a co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. He brought an offering to Paul from the church. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him and, and not only on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. I'll finish there. My final point is this, that the heroes for Paul were not the people with great public reputations. They were people with reputations in the church for serving one another diligently and I believe what the final part of this chapter teaches us is that we need to be selective about who we consider are our heroes and those who model the life of faith that we want to emulate it's very easy in a world where we have access to so many preachers and teachers that we build our heroes around those who are on stages with platforms in front of tens of thousands of people and assume that that is the best representation of a hero of the faith. But when we do that, we overlook those who are diligently serving in the local church, taking care of one another's needs, who are equal, if not more heroic in the way that they love Jesus and they serve one another. Paul was emphasizing Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now you may say, well, in a modern modern day scenario, Tim Timothy would have TimothyInternationalMinistries.com and he'd be out there taking large offerings and speaking to tens of thousands of people. We just don't know. But particularly Epaphroditus, he was an elder within the church in Philippi and he'd come and he brought an offering here to Paul and, and, and showed service to him. Even when he was ill in the travel and he almost died as a consequence of it, Paul was saying this level of service, this diligence, this commitment to the cause, I'm going to draw attention to these guys because naturally they would be overlooked. But really, I want you to see these guys as heroes. And I think if anything that the, the, this whole COVID thing has taught us is how much we overlook the heroic status of people who are just driving buses, who are working in ICU uh, wards, who are doctors and nurses, who are doing stuff for our country that film stars, pop stars, and any other so-called star just cannot equal in their level of value to us as a nation at this time. And so Paul, recognizing that sometimes heroes get overlooked and they don't get recognized because they're blending into the background, just getting their head down, working hard, 
doing what they feel that they need to, to love one another, to serve one another. Paul was saying, I'm going to bring these guys into the spotlight, into the focus for a moment. I want you to see these guys as being incredibly valuable. These guys are modeling to you the type of life that you need to live as a Christian. And unless I highlight them, you may overlook them. And in your overlooking of them, you'll start to maybe look at other types of, of person within the church or some itinerant apostle that's coming through town and make them your model of faith. And while that by itself might not always be a problem, there were some great apostles traveling around in the first century. They would miss out on the substance of service. Some guys like this left as a legacy in the church that they should be given proper attention and they should be used as examples to copy and to follow and as people would emulate timothy and emulate epaphroditus what they would do is they would do things that built the unity of the church timothy and epaphroditus they didn't compromise on truth but they were people who's by their christ likeness by them in their own lives, doing what Jesus was taught, told, said to have done from in, in chapter two of coming down from heaven and take, taking a lowly position to try and serve and to love one another. Epaphroditus and Timothy were doing that. They were great examples of Christ and they should be in focus, Paul says, for you, church, so that you live like the real heroes of faith. Don't overlook those who are just getting about their business and serving the local church. church. You should make sure they are given plenty of attention because not for their own glory, but for the glory they show of how they serve Jesus, that is a great way of life to follow. So we'll end it there on chapter two, and we'll take some questions.